as we've been looking at Romans, we've uh, seen how the Apostle Paul creates that really dark picture. <laughs> the truth of where we stand before God under his wrath, without any excuse. And then he breaks in at 321 and says, but now, and we see the answer that God had. And the answer was that in Christ uh, there would be a way, or through the death and resurrection of Christ, there was a way that God was able to justly forgive uh, uh, sinners. Those that come in repentance and faith are able to be declared justified. And that is the, uh, the opposite to being under condemnation, God's God's wrath. And, uh, and it's the same for Jew and Gentile. Uh, it, there's no distinction, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he says that this message he's given is not something that is uh, just coming from his own ideas, but it's something that was confirmed by the law and the prophets. And then he gives an example of that in chapter 4, looking at Abraham and David, but particularly Abraham, how uh, when he expounds uh, what to us is Genesis 15, how uh, Abraham became the father of those who have faith. And very cleverly, uh, he points out that the promise made in chapter 15 was before the sign of circumcision, which is chapter 17. And so he says, Abraham becomes the father of those who are not circumcised, i.e. Gentiles, as well as those who are circumcised, that's the Jews. And again, he's showing that it is um, Jew and Gentile are one. Abraham is their father, that he, uh, even as it said, in, in Genesis 12, 1, that Abraham will be blessed, he will be having uh, descendants and nations, so that all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him. And when we're looking at the Apostle Paul speaking about the gospel going to the Jew and the Gentile, this promise to Abraham, the fulfillment of that promise, is never far away uh, from this thinking. And then in chapter 5, we get this uh, uh, conclusion of what God has done. Therefore, we are justified by faith. We have peace with God. And then he moves on to speak about how the, the way the death and resurrection of Christ could be uh, made effective for many people is because... Uh, Christ is the head of the new creation and in the same way as Adam was the head of the old creation and what he did had influence and, and, and uh, affected others so the work of Christ is head of the new creation even as we are in Adam we are also in Christ yes. having uh, unpacked that and making some glorious statements about the grace of God and how uh, when sin abounds, grace abounds, he then uh, addresses some issues about, okay, if we are justified by faith, what does that mean for our lifestyle? How do we then live? And he also seems to be uh, picking up this side comment in chapter 3 about those who slander Paul saying that his message of grace produces license, uh, produces people who are not living holy lives. And in chapter 6 he, and, and 7, he works through a number of these issues. And he says how we cannot continue in sin that grace may abound. The thought of that is uh, an awful thought. And the reason is because of our union with the death uh, and resurrection of Christ. Our solidarity with Adam has been broken, uh, we are dead to sin, and we need to recognize that and live in the good of that. 
And uh, also at the end of chapter 6, he underlines the fact that, uh, remember, when you were sinning and you were slaves of sin, the result of that was death. Sin has consequences. And so to keep on sinning is, we could say, it was stupid. Uh, what we need to do is, is uh, become slaves of righteousness because out of righteousness comes life and, uh, and sanctification. And then he then uh, turns his attention especially to the Jews who would be thinking about the law because the law was seen as a means of being right with God. And if we are justified by faith, then maybe the law can help us live right. And he works through saying, no, that we can't then go back to the law for a lifestyle because the law is not able to produce that life. Uh, what the law does is exposes what, what sin is and uh, condemns us, but there, it has no ability to help us. And uh, the illustration we used was that husband who was the perfect husband and, uh, <laughs> and was uh, able to point out when his wife did wrong. And it was able to do that really well. But there was no ability there to actually help her live differently. And the, uh, the solution is we are dead to the law as well. The Jews were dead to the law, but dead so we can be alive to another. And the, that which we're alive to is the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that we do not serve under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. And he unpacks that in chapter 8, how God has done what the law, weak by our flesh, and let me just say here that, that when Paul uses flesh in this context, he's talking about our humanity that is weakened through sin, or humanity that is uh, in solidarity with Adam. Or, or that arena of human weakness. And he's saying this is now, uh, ha has, been, has been died, ha sorry, has died, and, um, or, excuse me, let me say this again, that God, that God has done in Christ what the, the flesh could not do because of its weakness of sin, and... Um, and in the likeness of sinful flesh, he has died and been raised so that we may walk in the new life of the Spirit. Let me read it so we get it right. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with the sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Uh, so in other words, we, we keep the law, and as we mentioned, uh, that's not all of the many details, but that indeed the spirit of the law, uh, as he speaks about in chapter 13, uh, but we're able to do that because of the new life of the Spirit. And then he talks about the exhortation of setting our mind on the things of the Spirit and putting to death the works of the flesh. And as somebody once said to me many years ago, if you imagine that you had two babies, if you feed one it will flourish and if you starve one it will die. <laughs> and, and what we're to do is to feed uh, that, if that, that spiritual element of us, if you like, and uh, when it comes to the works of the flesh, we're to seek to starve them. And uh, we want to go strong in our relationship with God and uh, walking in the Spirit by setting our mind on the things of the Spirit. And so when we come to the, uh, the second part of chapter 8, the, the verse 12 following, the thing I love about this here is how uh, when we were... Uh, uh, under law, uh, that law was like a, a, a slave master. Um, but uh, what he wants to say here is that now that you are living new life in the Spirit, 
the relationship is very different. It, we're not slaves anymore, but sons. And he speaks here about how we have the spirit of adoption. Verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons. And the Roman law, as we understand it, was really very strong when it came to adoption. Uh, some of the elements of adoption under Roman law was that when a, a person was adopted into a family, uh, there was a complete break with the past. Uh, you lost all your rights in your old family and you had all of the rights of a legitimate son in the new family. And they were so absolute that if you were adopted into a family and at a later point uh, that your new father and mother had a natural son, there was no way that that natural son would usurp your position as the firstborn. <laughs> because being adopted, you were adopted 100% into that family as a true son. And so if then a natural child was born, they became, if you like, like the second born. Uh, another thing is that the old life, your old life was completely wiped out. If you had any debts, they were all cancelled. And it's like you had a, a really fresh sun, a fresh start. So that in law, you are absolutely a son of your new father. And so when the Apostle Paul is writing to the Romans about adoption, this is what would have been in their mind. This uh, wonderful embracing into the family of God. And it is uh, this spirit of adoption that we receive whereby we cry Abba. And then he translates that because it means Father. And it is his very spirit witnessing with our spirit that we are children of God. And so this change, the work of the spirit, uh, is that we have, been mo we have moved from that realm of being in, under slavery and fear into that realm of being children of God. And we're not just children of God, we're sons of God. And all of us are sons of God, because this thing isn't about gender. You know, in Scripture there's different images used, and one of them is that uh, we are the bride of Christ. Now, 50% of the population may be able to relate to that a little bit more, than the other, <laughs> but we are all the bride of Christ. And in adoption, we're actually sons. And the reason that's important is because the sons were those who received the inheritance uh, under law. And that is true for all of us, male or female. And so we are adopted as sons into uh, the, the family. And then you may have noticed in chapter 5 and in many of Paul's letters, 2 Corinthians is a big one, here as well, the Apostle Paul will then speak about how we are children and if, or if sons, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. That to me is just amazing language to try and get my head around that. Joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, and one of the reasons I think that the Apostle Paul would speak about suffering is because for many people, the fact that there was still suffering didn't quite work with the understanding of the gospel. Because, you know, if the gospel is a true gospel, surely we should be free from all that. You know, we're above that. We are reigning in Christ. There's a lovely piece of uh, kind of sarcasm in 
1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. When the apostle is talking to the Corinthian church, he's, he's saying, you know, I'm so happy that you're kings and I'm so happy that you're, you're reigning. And then he says, but I actually wish you were you know, and it's because these guys had had this understanding that it, it being in Christ meant that you had kind of come above all those uh, earthly things and, and if you're still suffering then you're not really very spiritual. Uh, but the Apostle is, is relating to the fact that we're still part of the now, even though we can celebrate and are embracing the not yet of um, realized eschatology. We're still living in a fallen world. And he uh, says that, that suffering may be part of that. And so we embrace that. But we do that because there's a future hope. And that future hope is that we are glorified with him. And so the classic understanding of this portion of Romans is that the apostle begins by talking about the problem. And then he talks about the uh, element of justification then he moves on to sanctification, and then he moves on to what uh, theologians like to call glorification. And that's what we'll have a look at next. Uh, before we look at this last part of Romans 8 that talks about, as I mentioned, uh, glorification, that's what people like to, to call it, uh, uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. I was reading this this morning and reflecting on something that the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1. Now, in my SBS, one of the first books we did was Ephesians, and the teacher we had, uh, Dr. Earl Morey, assured us that Ephesians 1 verses 9 and 10 were the key verses. And uh, I remember reading them, and you know how you can read something, but you kind of have no idea what you're reading. <laughs> I would I'd be reading these verses and, and I wasn't able to connect with what on earth they're saying. And it took me actually a long time uh, to uh, connect with that. And one of the reasons is because it's as if uh, he's talking about what God has done for us in Christ. When it comes to chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it's as if all of a sudden he's expanding out uh, to talk about the, 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 the cosmic purposes of God in just a really massive and broad way. Uh, it says here, He has made known to us the mystery of his will. Mystery, of course, is something that was hidden but is now made known. It's not mystery in the sense of, you've got to figure this out because it's a big secret. He has uh, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. And we can say, okay, what was that mystery? And we have it in verse 10, and that is a plan. God has a plan, and that plan is this, that in the fullness of time, that God would unite all things in him, that's in Christ. And then we see the, the cosmic nature of this uniting, all things in heaven and all things on earth. And so there's this massive plan that God has that at the right time, ultimately, everything is going to be united in Christ. Now, I want to just paint this picture so that we can then go into Romans. Uh, because I think this is something that is behind uh, uh, what Paul is saying in Romans and what kind of affirms it. Uh, I want you to come with me in your imagination back to Genesis, uh, Genesis 1 and 2. And uh, when we look at the creation as God created it, in the beginning everything was what I would call, it was together in harmony or shalom. That harmony, that unity, uh, was in every direction. In, that, in those early chapters, you see that humanity in the person of, of Adam uh, had 
the or he enjoyed the immediate presence of God. We get this picture, don't we, that in a garden that was planted, which in my thinking would have been a bit more like one of the national parks we have in some of their countries, that that in the cool of the day, God and Adam would be fellowshipping together. And, and I don't quite know how that looked, but the impression you get is there was uh, Adam enjoying God's immediate presence. And then we look at Adam and Eve. Uh, humanity in the person of Adam and Eve, they knew perfect harmony in their relationship too. You get this picture, they were naked and unashamed, nothing between them. Uh, perfect unity, if you like, perfect harmony. And then in the created order, Adam was doing his business in the garden, whatever that was, and the animals were coming past and he was naming them. And, and again, the picture you get is that of, of, of ha complete harmony. And the point is, is that when sin entered in chapter 3, all of that was broken. And it was broken in every direction. Uh, when Adam, uh, when Adam uh, would normally have been spending time with God, he was hiding. And, and God was reaching out, saying, "Adam, where are you?" And when he found him, he, you know, he, he said, uh, "Who told you you were naked? You know what's happened?" And and Adam turned around and said, "Well, uh, God, uh, that woman that that you gave me, she made me do this thing." And so you find fear, and you find accusation, and you find brokenness in that relationship that at one time knew complete harmony. And there, as we mentioned before, Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden, out of that immediate presence of God. There was still a relationship there, we, we know that. But that unity which was there was broken. We see Adam and Eve, they had, um, they realized that they were, were naked and they tried to put these clothes together. And you find this accusation and fear and guilt and blame. And their relationship but was no longer uh, that relationship of shalom, of, of unity, harmony. And the created order, all of a sudden the earth, began to yield uh, weeds and, and, and there was sweat and toil working with the earth and, and uh, the animal was killed and, and so on and so forth. And the picture we get in those few words is that in every direction, the harmony, the unity was shattered. And, and then as we continue to read in Genesis chapter 4 through 11, what you get is the, the consequences of what we call the fall, of, of humanity choosing to rebel against God. The consequences are worked out in those chapters where you see find sin just multiplied. You come to the time of Noah and the violence on the earth was so great that it says that humanity, that's all they thought about. And, and God stepped in and, uh, in a sense, started again with Noah and his family. But it wasn't long before we have more trouble and more problems, with the Tower of Babel being the final one that's mentioned. And it's as if those early chapters are speaking about the beginning, the fall, the consequences of the fall, then, of course, we come to chapter 12 of Genesis, and now that you've, you've, done, you've looked at Genesis, and so you know how God then breaks in. And when he breaks in, he begins his plan of redemption. But his plan of redemption is as it is described in Ephesians. The plan is that there will come a time when all things will be united uh, in Christ. In other words, that which was lost in the garden is going to be restored. And uh, when you do uh, Revelation next week, I don't know if you'll do this, I would recommend it. And that is, you do a, a, a comparison between those first three chapters of the Bible 
and the last three chapters of the Bible. Because what you see is what was lost there is regained. In other words, the whole story of the Bible is working its way forward to something. And that something is the, the, the restoration of all that was lost with a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And, and it is centered in Christ. And it is this that uh, we read about now in Romans. Because that understanding of the awfulness of sin in chapter three, uh, chapters 1, 2, and the first part of 3, the fact that uh, God has broken in and come in with a plan in Christ uh, to set people free from the tyranny of sin and all that was happening, this, um, the fact that there is now a new federal head, <laughs> Christ, and we are now in Christ, uh, the fact that the Holy Spirit has been given all this uh, is leading to chapter 8 and what we're looking at now. And people call, call this, in theological terms, glorification. Uh, but what it's meaning, really, is the culmination of God's redemptive purposes that are being worked out of in history. And we are part of that, of course, that working out. And so uh, let's turn to back to Romans uh, chapter 8 verse 18 and we pick this up because he's talked about the suffering uh, that may well be part of our experience here in this broken fallen world still but he says I consider this suffering of this present time uh, now in this evil age not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And this is why people use the word glorification, because uh, uh, this word here. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. In other words, that ultimate end time, when we are enjoying all of the blessings in their fullness, that we now have in part uh, because of the work of Christ. For creation was subject f uh, to futility. Uh, that's what happened when the ground was cursed in chapter 3 of Genesis. One of the consequences of the fall was the toil and the extra effort. Uh, this world, this physical world is broken. It's not what it should be. Even as we see, broken humanity. For creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. Because that wasn't the end. There was a, a plan of redemption, and that plan of redemption included the whole cosmos, <laughs> not just people. That creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay, and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And so, uh, when we talk about, in uh, to use Paul's terms in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation, or part of that new creation. When he speaks in Isaiah chapter 65 and 66 about a new heaven and a new earth, and of course this is taken up in, in Revelation, He's talking about this, that there will come a time when everything is freed from decay. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, and we say amen to that. You know, all that's going on in this house, and all that's happening in my family, and and all of everything we see on the news so often. We know that the whole of creation is being groaning in labour pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly while we wait for adoption. 
And so he's uh, said a bit earlier that we have been adopted, but now he says we wait for adoption. You can see how important the understanding of the now and the not yet is. Otherwise, how does that work? Have we been or are we going to be? You know, which is it? Uh, but we see it is both. We're enjoying now what will happen in the future. We enjoy now as children, uh, as sons of God. Uh, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. And this is this passage we looked at yesterday. This is what Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The fact that at the moment we do not have these new bodies. Well, that is something that will happen in the future, even when we come to the new heaven and the new earth. For in hope we are saved. There's so much that we hope for as Christians, because we have only the down payment at the moment. We have just the partial. But we hope, there's so much we hope for. For in hope we were saved. This future hope is part of our salvation. Now, hope what is seen, for who hopes for what is seen? You know, you, you don't hope for breakfast this morning because you've had it. Well, and if you haven't, that was your choice, but you know. <laughs> you don't have to hope for that. But we hope for lunch because uh, we haven't had that yet, you know. And, and so uh, the fact that the future is hope is because we haven't seen it yet. For who hopes for what is seen? Uh, but if we hope for what has not been seen, we wait with it for patience. And then, as we're waiting for patient, with it for patience, the Holy Spirit is involved. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, since the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so we groan and we wait, but we don't wait alone, because the Holy Spirit has been given to us, uh, has been there, and, and it is that Holy Spirit which is echoing in our hearts, Abba, Father, uh, because he is the spirit of adoption. And we know that God works all things together for good. Some translations say that all things work together for good, but that's not really uh, what it's saying, uh, because it's not some sort of fatalistic thing. So that would be all right. You notice on the movies, that's often one of the favorite, uh, favorite uh, sayings. You know, everything's a catastrophe, everything's going bad, and someone looks at the other and says, it's going to work out okay. You know, and uh, no, it's, it, you know, in those cases, often it doesn't. But one of the assurances we have as those who are in Christ is that God works all things together for good. What a wonderful promise to those who love God and who are called according to his purposes. For those whom he foreknew, the foreknowledge of God is something that is completely consistent throughout Scripture. A God uh, who does not have a beginning like we have, <laughs> whose relationship with uh, this element, this dimension that we are in called time, whose, whose relationship with that is different. A uh, God who, uh, who has this foreknowledge, who sees uh, the future as we see the past, only more perfectly. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And this is God's purpose. God's purpose is that when we come to Christ, we will be transformed. And even as the image of God was lost, uh, or shattered, or distorted through sin, so it is the work of the Spirit be transforming us from one degree of glory into the image 
even as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. God has a purpose, and his purpose is his uh, foreordained purpose for us is that we would be conformed into the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. God's purpose is that there will be many sons that reflect the glory of Jesus. That's his purpose. And we have been adopted into that family. And, and there's going to be many, many Jesus-like people because that is what God intended right in the very beginning. <laughs> All with their own personalities, of course. But reflecting the, the nature and the character of Jesus. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. And that is the word that is used to talk about those, those that final goal. Now he brings this uh, portion to a close uh, in 31. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And that's a rhetorical question and we know the answer. He whom did not withhold his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not with him also give us everything else? That is everything that he's just spoken about, the, the conclusion of all things, the hope that we have that is certain. Who will bring any charge against God's elect? Now, it's interesting that he goes back to reaffirm the power of justification that we're declared not guilty. Because again, he's using law court language. Uh, when he says, who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is God who's declared as not guilty. Who will condemn? It's interesting that uh, we, we meet, we're introduced to Satan in Job uh, chapter 1 in the Bible. And the word Satan means accuser. That's what it means. Uh, the Satan, the accuser. And uh, here he says, who is going to accuse? Who's going to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died. Well, the answer is no one. If, if, if God justifies, declares us guilty, then we should uh, not accept, not put up with anything other than what God declares over us. That is, we are right with him. Who will condemn? It is God who justifies. Uh, who will condemn? Sorry. Uh, it is Jesus Christ who died. Yes, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? And then he starts going through this long list of of elements, and of course the answer is nothing is going to separate us from the love of Christ. A hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. He then quotes Psalm 44, 22, As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. Trials and tribulations are not a sign of God's disfavour. When things go wrong, when things are hard, uh, today, even today, we can think, if things are awkward, difficult, the question is, does God will love, still love me? Why am I in all these challenging issues if God loved me? Well, it's as if the Apostle Paul was saying, you should expect hardship and difficulties and troubles and persecutions. We're in a fallen, broken world. That's what it's going to be like. So don't think it will be different. But when it is like that, recognize that none of these things, nothing that happens to you, can separate you from the love of God. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, 
uh, he's spoken a lot about sin and death and he's spoken a lot about justification in life and and here he talks about uh, the, the area of death again or, or life or angels or rulers or things present or things to come or powers or height or depth or anything else in all creation he's kind of wrestling here to try and cover everything <laughs> and in case he didn't cover something he says not anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord and with this glorious doxology, he brings uh, to a close uh, this journey he's had us on of the unfolding purposes of God uh, from the fallenness of human sinfulness, the image of God shattered because people are worshipping uh, images of animals and uh, human beings all the way through to the glorification, as people like to call it, the fulfillment of all things, the restoration of what was lost, the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth, uh, the, the physical creation restored back to its glory, however you want to say it. He's brought us on that journey, uh, and he's finished by recognizing that at the moment we're still in a fallen, broken world. And while we're here, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And with that, he brings this portion to an end. And as we're going to see, uh, if you go to chapter 12, chapter 12 follows on really beautifully from this passage. It follows on and says, OK, now because of the mercies of God, this is how we should live. <laughs> and he picks up on the... Uh, the, what he said in chapter 6 and chapter 8 about our members. Uh, we should uh, offer our bodies as a living sacrifice and we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind, as he says in chapter 8. And he talks about practical outworkings of that in the community of Christians there in Rome. Let no one think more highly than you ought to think. Think with sober judgment and recognize there's, diver there's diversity in the unity we have different gifts and we celebrate the differences as well as and uh, so on and so forth uh, but actually he doesn't finish there we have chapters 9 10 11 and we'll look at those next <laughs>